Hello and welcome to this Mindful and Resilient Leadership webinar. My name is Simon Haig and I'm delighted to be joined by two great inspiring leaders and thinkers. Uh, two people I know very well, friends and supporters of my own. First up is uh, the inimitable Marshall Goldsmith, Marshall's world number one leadership thinker, executive coach, best-selling author, and many other things. Hi, Marshall. How are you? Yeah, I'm mostly the other things. <laughs> Probably right now. But it's great to see you, and it's great to have you here. And, and second, I'm a, a great friend of mine uh, and colleague of mine in the Mindset and Mindfulness Training Institute, Justin Caffrey. Hi, Justin. Hi, Simon. Thanks. Great. Thanks for having me on. And hard to, follow, hard to follow Marshall, but great to be here. <laughs> it's great to see you both. So we were just saying before we press record that we're living in very unique times that I think really require strong leadership. I might start with you, Marshall. What would you say are the key traits for effective leadership right now? I think right now, when people are under periods of extreme stress and crisis, they do not need less structure, they need more. And they need a sense of where are we going now? So I'm going to ramble around a little bit to your question. But yeah. one thing I would suggest, every leader have a regular dialogue with everyone who they report to and deal with six basic questions. Question number one, where are we going? And I would say, here's where I see us going, our big issues, our priorities, and ask, where do you think we should be going? Question number two, where are you going? As a leader, I'd say, here's where I see you and your part of the business going. What do you think? Because you want alignment two ways, the leader and the team, but also the bigger picture and the smaller picture. Number three, doing well. Here's what I think you're doing very well. Because even in times of crisis, people are doing a lot of good things. Then ask the person a question, what are you most proud of today? In this crisis, what do you think you're doing best? And sometimes we learn from others things that we didn't really appreciate. What are you doing well? Then question number four, uh, suggestions for the future. I like feed forward more than feedback, mm. rather than focusing on let's talk about what you or we did wrong, which you can't change anyway. Moving forward, here's some ideas I might have. And then ask a question, if you were the coach for you, what ideas right now or suggestions would you have? So have a dialogue. Then question number five as the leader, how can I help? How can I help you? And then question six, what ideas do you have for me? Six basic questions. By the way, I'll send you a copy of the article. I published this. I'll send you a copy of it. It's really good for crisis. Then ask a question, though. Say, look, if you ever feel ambiguity, confusion, you're not clear priorities, talk to me. Because, it, and, and by the way, also what I call, uh, uh, you know, pragmatism at the same time, optimism, pragmatic optimism. I'd say, look, yeah. here it is. Here we are. You can't sugarcoat this and make bad look good. On the other hand, let's just focus on how we can make the best of what we've got right now. Encourage that person to talk to you. And then at any second in time, they should have clarity. And be honest, though. And say, I'll mm -hmm. be honest. This may change. Today's priority may not be tomorrow's priority. It may change immediately. Yeah. On yeah. the other hand, I want you to feel comfortable where you are now. And by the way, I think back to the human dimension, we need to do this too. Let me give you an example, a golfer. I'm not a golfer, my co-writer is a great golfer. You hit a drive, perfect drive, right down the middle. There's a rock, unfortunately, in the fairway. Now, you didn't put the rock there, the rock's not supposed to be there, but somebody left a rock, boom. Your ball hits the rock, creams over into the rough, terrible life. Your first reaction is anger, whatever, it's not fair. The great golfers got to learn one thing, let it go. Mm. Yep. You can't think about what happened in the past. You get in front of that shot, then you have to come up with a strategy. What's my strategy now? Is it to go for the green? Is it to put on the fairway? What do I want to do now? Come up with a strategy. Then whatever strategy you pick, don't think about winning the tournament. Don't think about how bad the break was. Focus on one thing. Hit the shot in front of you. Yeah. Hit the shot in front of you. Back to mindfulness. Hit the shot in front of you. Hit this shot. And basically, that's all you can do. And there are only two questions you have to answer. Question number one, did I do at that second in time what I thought was right? By the way, we're not going to guess it all the time. 
<laughs> Sometimes maybe you think you should go for the green and you should have laid up. Well, did I do what I thought was right? Mm -hmm. And question two, did I do my best to execute? If the answer is yes, I did what I thought was right. And yes, I did my best to execute. That's all you can do. Then Perfect. after that, you take a deep breath and go to sleep at night. <laughs> You're so right, Marcel. Uh, Justin, you, following on from that and aligning with that, you, you talk and, and espouse a lot about the flow state and, and the importance, exactly as Marshall said, of continual practice, looking forward. Do you want to elucidate a little bit more about the flow state to build on from what Marshall just spoke about? Yeah, I think, I think really, uh, as Marshall said, you know, one of the key things, I think, especially in a time of crisis, is the capacity to also access what we do as instinct as leaders. Because when we allow ourselves to get caught into the brain, into the mind, the overthinking, you know, the constant dialogue with the news and getting caught into the news feed, we step away from what it is that instinctively got us to this place of leadership. You know, there's a reason why we're here. And it's not because we're the best thinkers. We're not this, you don't need to be the smartest guy in the room. You just need to be the most capable in a multitude of emotional and, and intellectual abilities. So, just having that sense of capacity to be instinctful in the way that you operate and 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 that, that golfing analogy is beautiful you know just as we say in in all sports you know just play the next ball don't go further than that because this is crisis and it's a time for thinking differently but one thing i, I think is interesting too is remembering within your leadership teams that there may be people outside of that team that you can bring in right now because and at a crisis moment, often the leaders that you need are not the ones that you may have brought in because the guys who have been in there managing the business from an operational perspective, if it's been running and humming quite well through a good economy, are not necessarily the same team that you got to bring into the war room. Uh, absolutely. And just bringing that back to what Marsh was talking about, you know, in my experience, some of the best leaders – have been as co corporately honest as they possibly could. Because if you, if you operate through the prism of corporate honesty, right? Okay, then there's things like confidentiality and privacy. If you don't operate through that prism, human beings fill the gap. So human beings generally start worrying about things. They make, they form assumptions. So um, I, I just want to build on, move then onto the whole subject of trust and leadership. So we all we all know what trust lack of trust feels like we know what lack of trust feels like but it's very hard to articulate what trust is from a leader, leadership perspective marshall i mean do you want to say much much about the whole area of trust and how particularly important it is right now in leadership well i'll just talk about what i do as it relates to trust i'm not an expert on all elements of the topic but i can relate it to what i do what I do for a living is everyone I coach has to get confidential feedback from everyone around them. Then they all stand up and they admit, they say, I feel great about this. Here's what I want to do better. Then they ask for help. And they are taught to listen and thank people, not promising to do everything, but to do what they can. And then to follow up and really make an effort to try to get better. And that sounds pretty simple. Very few leaders do it. Very few leaders do it. And, you know, being able to say, look, uh, you know, I'm the one thing I'm proud of my book triggers 27 major CEOs endorsed the book. Now, why am I proud of that? 30 years ago, no CEO would admit to having a coach. Correct. Well, these are 27 important people saying, hello, my, I'm the CEO of the year. I need help. Yeah. Number two CEO of the year. I need help. I'm the CEO of Walmart. I need help. I'm the president of World Bank. I need help. We all need help. Exactly. And I think when you are honest with people and you quit trying to be better than them, and you realize, look, we're all in this together. We all need help. Don't make yourself above them. Number one, you aren't above them. And yeah. number two, they know you're not above them. So why play games? Yeah. So to me, a way to build trust is to demonstrate this kind of vulnerability and to have the courage to look in the mirror, to have the humility to admit you can improve, and then have the discipline to do something about it and try to actually get better as opposed to just listen to people. Absolutely. J Justin and I gave a program recently at a university in the UK, and um, that was the biggest feedback from, from one participant was there isn't a single person in the world who doesn't question themselves. And yet so many corporate leaders pretend that they're not like they're not vulnerable. J just moving on. So the whole area of resilience. So, so Justin, we talk about in our, in our institute, 
the importance of calmness, listening, being measured, and resilience. And then you, you talk about you need those four traits to then move on and be to, to create a vision. Leaders, good leaders, have good followers, but they need to have those attributes. Do you want to sort of elucidate a little bit more about those key attributes of, of leaders? Yeah, I think I think it's I think actually it kind of follows on from that point that you guys made. You know, if it's almost like if we create this sense of infallibility, the problem is that when you screw up, which inevitably you will, um, you know, you fall pretty hard and fast if you've created this sense amongst those people around you that you were infallible and, and that your judgment should never be questioned. And I think it's the the vision that you need to build around your leadership team and, and in a time of crisis right now is is really to give them the sense that, you know, the strength of the organization to get through these difficult times is the sum of all the parts. So really build that collaborative sense, you know, so the calmness that you bring to those meetings, because people are arriving in right now coming from crisis at home, crisis from their, from their investments, crisis from their family and health crisis, you know, people are actually dying in their immediate family. So you need to bring down the mood to a sense of calmness, centering and balancing. And then your capacity to be resilient and to listen compassionately, but also to then build that vision. So take what those people have brought to you, and, and some of them will be phenomenal nuggets of value. But, but ultimately, the vision is also built by your capacity to strip away things that you believe that are superfluous. And you have to do that right now and be ruthless because time is against you making these tough calls. Uh, absolutely absolutely one just linking that then back to how companies are perceived and their leaders perceived so uh, you know i represent a company in the uk called brand finance and they value corporate brands and the value of corporate brands are just plummeting in certain sectors right now and um you know cfos i'm talking to cfos and cmos and they're all over the place about how um tough they should be looking uh, in terms of continuing to sell and market, whether they should be a bit more uh, compassionate, a bit softer selling. Marshall, in terms of how leaders manage organizations, on the one hand, they need to be compassionate uh, and, and deal with empathy, but they also need to make really tough decisions if they need to lay staff off, if they need to quarantine certain parts of the business. How would you advise, because I'm talking to CFOs over here in Ireland and they're sort of wondering how to balance the two the two prisons of calm, courageous, compassionate leadership, but also tough decisions. How would you say to leaders that they can balance those two parts? One, you're running a business. You're not running a charity. <laughs> That's life. Two, exactly. I don't care how you cut it. If you're in a publicly traded corporation, you have shareholders. Yep. Your shareholders gave you money and your job is to provide a return on that investment. And by the way, it's easy to be magnanimous with someone else's money. One thing I always try to point out to the CEO, it's not your money. It's the shareholder's money. Yeah. And by the way, you can give away all you want to to look good. At the end of the day, you give away too much out of the shareholders are going to say goodbye, goodbye, see you around. So it's not your money. And at the end of the day, you need to point out to the people, this is hard. This is hard. I mean, the greatest leader I've ever met, or one of them is Alan Mulally, who was a CEO of Ford and Boeing, fantastic. In his lifetime, he's laid off 50,000 people. Now he saved a million jobs and you know, at Ford, he got a 97 approval rating, 97% approval rating for every employee in a union company. They love that guy. Yet he still has had to make hard decisions. He's the nicest guy in the world. Yeah. It's, you got to look people in the eye and tell them the truth. This is not, you're a bad person. There's something wrong with you. This is the reality. The reality is we don't have that job anymore. Neiman Marcus, one of the biggest companies in America in terms of fashion, just went bankrupt. They didn't kind of go bankrupt, they went bankrupt. Yep. You gotta deal with the reality that's there and a lot of jobs are gone. They're not coming back. Mm -hmm. You have to tell people the truth and there's no amount of happy talk or positive thinking that's gonna get you through this. You just have to tell people the truth. You wanna do it in a compassionate way. You wanna do it in a fair way. You just have to tell the truth and you can't hide from the truth because yeah. I think, you know, it's worse when you try to BS people and pretend everything's going to be okay. Then you end up having to fire them anyway. That's worse because you've created an illusion. So I think very important during hard times to tell people the truth, do it in a fair, compassionate way. 
do it in an honest way. And for every executive, it's not your money. Yeah. You have to remember that it's not your money. Correct. So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes CEOs get into this show off thing about look how magnanimous and wonderful I am and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Well, yeah, you're doing that with someone else's money. Correct. 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 J Justin, you and I gave a podcast a couple of weeks ago to some senior CFO and, and financial people. And, and, and you said exactly the same as Marshall, Marshall there, that you really have to get your house in order right now. But this was a month ago, deal with your credit lines. Don't right. pretend otherwise. And uh, as Marshall just said, Justin, do you want to add anything, anything to that in terms of strong, decisive leadership? Yeah, I like I completely agree, and and you know I've I've led I led businesses through the, the last um, financial crisis and September the 11th in, in the financial services market, and it's hard to let people go, and 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 you know I've been at the front line and and had to let a lot of people go during those crises, but what you have to be able to do is to understand that to protect the mothership is the most important thing because your ability to save many other people's jobs is dependent on making those cuts. So they have to come quick, deep, and fast, and you've got to protect your cash flow because once your cash flow is gone, whilst we're having credit tightening across the global market from a financial services perspective, nobody's going to roll in and give you money. So you have to protect your money now. So really, you're laying off some people, but you're really protecting a lot of others. And, and as Marshall said, avoiding this kind of magnanimous approach, you've just got to be bloody honest and say, this is why I'm doing it. This is the policy. It is what it is. Ab 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 absolutely. Ab are, are either of you seeing good examples of leadership right now? Are you seeing this, Marshall? Yeah, many good examples. I think I'm seeing many great examples of leadership. Uh, to me, a common myth, I hear this all the time, are leaders worse than they ever were in the past? Or are leaders more bullies than they ever were in the past? This is such nonsense. I mean, in the past, we had slaveries, we had serfs. What percent of the people in your country, in Ireland, were treated like dogs, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, were leaders as bad as they were in the past? They're much better than the past. You think they're <laughs> bad now? Read a history book sometime. They Correct. had kings. Now, what could that king do to you? You know what? Anything he felt like. And what are you going to do about it? Absolutely nothing. Well, that was leadership in the past, right? So, yeah, there are a lot of great leaders out there who I think are, are I think leadership is better than ever. Not all leadership, of course. There are terrible leaders today that we've discussed. On the other hand, in general, I think leaders are better than they were. And I think there's a lot of examples of great leadership right now. Ab absolutely. Just Justin. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think I think we're seeing some great leadership across business right now, globally, and and companies are starting to make the tough calls. I think I think we're seeing huge differential in the context of political leadership, um, and I think we've we've got a great example of political leadership in Ireland at the moment because yeah. we have a government that doesn't that's already lost an election, so there's no politics attached to the decisions that they're making, right. and they're making the right decisions for the people also taken in the economics as well. Um, the challenge where you've got countries right now where there are political exposure in the context of upcoming elections, that makes the whole thing way more complicated. So we need a kind of a global cohesive approach. And, and I think that's just where we're struggling. I think companies are doing well, but, but from a global geopolitical standpoint, we're struggling. Absolutely. One thing that I'm hearing a lot from CFOs in particular is that they're, they're struggling with three like a three-legged stool. On the one hand, they need to reduce costs and create efficiencies now and, and cut credit lines. At the same time, and this kind of conflicts, they still need to keep putting communication campaigns out there. And at the same time, they need to keep an eye, uh, eye create a bridge to the future. So they need to keep their brand going. Marshall, how, how do good leaders balance those three, that three-legged stool? Of, three -legged stool? Well, I think, again, the term pragmatic optimism that is the reality that exists. You just say, here's where we are now in a very honest way. And you say, we're going to move forward in the future. Now, you know, I feel in many ways very fortunate. A lot of life is timing. I'm 71 years old. So um, this happened at a phase of my life where it's not career devastating. If I were 28 with two kids and a mortgage on a house, this would have been just awful. Yeah. Well, the last crisis, you know, I made a ton of money buying homes in Austin, Texas after the crash. 
you know, four or five years from today, this is going to be the greatest business opportunity ever. I think the world's going to be booming. And so what you really need to think about is all of the above, not one or two or three, but they're, they're just different. As, as Justin said, you got to think of all of the above. Number one is you got to take care of today's crisis. It is what it is. You can't hide from it and you're going to have to make cuts and you can't hire people to do work that isn't there. And by the way, many people are going to go broke. Oh, well, how can we not go broke? Well, the answer is four out of five businesses go broke anyway in 10 years. Yeah. They go broke anyway, four out of five. Well, what's going to happen now? Okay, it's now it's nine out of 10 or 95 out of 100. You know, hey, most small businesses, reality check, they're going broke. Yeah. They're not, those restaurants in New York City where I live, one of, the, one of my friends is one of the greatest restaurateurs in the world. Every one of his restaurants is going broke. They're not kind of going broke or sort of going broke. Goodbye. It's over. Yeah, carry out. You're running a Michelin restaurant and having carry out? No, you're not. That's a joke. It's yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. You're broke. Yeah. It's not yeah. coming back for a long time. Someone will rebuy those restaurants at 20 cents on a dollar and make money. Yeah, you're, you're, you're so right, Marshall. Ray Dalio was talking a week or so ago about you know, there will be a significant reorganization of assets and asset oh, classes no. and, and businesses and business lines. And, you know, the aviation sector will be completely different in a few years and on, you know, online sector. And there'll be amazing technologies to replace exact amazing technologies today. And, you know, currencies may be devalued, but the world will go on just in different, yeah. form, in different form. Um, Under new ownership. <laughs> under new ownership and, and they'll all probably be younger than the three of us <laughs> yeah. so, so, all right. i'm just look, i'm just as happy that i i'm not i'm happy i'm not 28 no i agree in fact i was i go walking every day with my wife and and i it, i just thought yesterday hit me yesterday I, I have two daughters they're 20 and 21 and i was thinking it doesn't matter to my wife and I that we're stuck in every day because we do that most times but my daughters can't meet their friends they can't go to the pub the club it's, it's a tough time for them, you know. So, J J Justin, you know, we'll, we'll bring this to a close in a couple of minutes, but how do you think leaders should lead when the future is so opaque? Or should they, back to what Justin was saying, just plow on? Um, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the difficulty is that you can overthink what you need to do right now. And I think it goes back to Marshall's original point about playing, you know, the next ball. I think, I think you've got to have a plan and a structure. You've got to have one eye on where you're bringing your business to, but you've got to just take each day as it comes. I mean, the, the, the amount of volatility that exists right now is just extreme. So, you know, you could have a great plan on Monday and then on, on Tuesday, you're going to have a situation where, you know, the, the, the vaccine ideas go out the window or, you know, the infection rates rise. So, so everything is up for grabs. And, and really, you know, from a business perspective, this is just survival of the fittest. Those who are still here will see huge opportunity. As Marshall said, there's going to be massive opportunity for people in the context of financial upside if you're still in the game. If you're out of the game, you're gone. So you've got to survive at all costs now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Just, just wrapping up, Marshall. If you had words of any words of wisdom to, for, you know, for for leaders who are struggling for inspiration right now, what two or three things would you be telling them to carry on doing or to stop doing now? Well, the first one is make peace with what is. Forgive yourself for being who you are. Forgive others for being who they are. Don't waste time on things you're not going to change anyway sitting there having a violent agreement about Donald Trump is bad over and over with somebody who obviously agrees with you. It's just a complete and total waste of your life. Don't waste your life on that crap. Really focus on, look, these are hard times. I don't have time to waste on what I can't change. Just focus on what can I do? Back to Justin's point, what can I do now? And again, two questions. Am I doing what I think is right now? Am I doing what, you may be wrong, okay? But you gotta give it your best shot or else you're paralyzed with indecision. Am I doing what I think is the right thing to do now? Get the data, realize it might change. And then the second question is, am I doing my best now? Am I doing my best to execute on what I think is right at this second in time? 
And then that's all you can do. And the other thing is make peace, make peace. And also, again, Hindu philosophy, the parable of the Gita is the one you can't get fixated on the end results. If you do, you're just going to screw with your head. If, by the way, if the wisdom of the Gita ever was illustrated, it's right now. Yep. Yeah. It's not your fault that there's a virus out there. It's not your fault that your restaurant's going to go broke. You're not a bad person. The point is, it is what it is. Here's where I am now. Don't waste your energy on what you can't do. It's not fair, all that other nonsense. Let it go. Here's yep. who I am now. How can I be the best I can be now? In your heart, you do what you think is right. You give it your best shot. Then you smile, you go on with life, and you make the best of it. Perfectly put, Marshall. Perfectly put. And Justin, you know, I don't know whether you know Marshall, but Justin's a Buddhist. And... Uh, you talk about the importance of not being attached and not striving. And how would you sum up your thoughts about those two aspects right now for leaders? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, Marshall put it so so well. I think from a philosophical standpoint, it's so important. And, and it is to avoid this whole idea of, of attachment to outcomes. You know, don't get drawn into what will be just be you know just get into it as it is right now and i think you know my mantra as as you know in my previous life in 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 private equity and investment management and investment banking would have been wake up show up do the work right yeah. as a buddhist psychologist my mantra is still exactly the same you know wake up show up for yourself and do the work you know it's it's the work that will nurture you in the end and i think just remembering from a leadership perspective to just take care of yourself, you know, get enough sleep, drink enough water, eat well, just take care of yourself right now. Because <laughs> if you're not, Marshall's demonstrating well right yeah. now, props at the hand. Um, if you're not doing that, you're not going to be able to function. So also just taking care of your real basic needs, because that's how you're going to make sure that the microbiome is working with the brain and you're able to make the right decisions. Perfectly put, perfectly put. And, and from my perspective, just to draw this to a close, it's been a wonderful converse, conversation. I, I, I like to quote something that, that comes from 12-step programs, and it's all about the importance of willingness, open-mindedness, and honesty, but above all else, honesty. And I think that's what you, you were really focusing on there, Marshall, that it's so important for leaders to be honest, even if it means being brutally honest. Uh, and likewise, Justin, you know, honesty is so so important in every aspect of your life so i really really want to honestly thank you for your time both both of you you're both really inspiring leaders you've been great supporters of me both of you over the years marshall it was great to have you at my book launch here in ireland a year ago and um, and i wish you all both the very very best thank you very much indeed both of you <laughs> thank you simon thanks marshall thank it's been a pleasure thank you